Well, welcome again to another podcast, Down to Earth, but Heavenly Minded. I'm your host, Irv Risch. And as we move forward, we're going to be going through the entire New Testament. Uh, and with that, we're going to do a commentary afterwards. And uh, with that said, let us just move on to our next section. And thank you for joining me. Chapter 26 When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? for she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. Now on the first day of unleavened bread the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful, and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, 
he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again for the second time he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So, leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and He will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the Scriptures be fulfilled, that it must be so? At that hour Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. 
Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Matthew chapter 26 14, The King's Passion and Death, chapters 26, 27 At the plot to kill Jesus, 26, 1, 5 26, 1, 2 For the fourth and last time in this gospel our Lord forewarned his disciples that he must die, 16, 21, 17, 23, 2018 his announcement implied a close time relationship between the Passover and his crucifixion, you know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. This year, the Passover would find its true meaning. The Paschal Lamb had at last arrived and would soon be slain. 26 colon 3 who 5 Even as he was uttering the words, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders were gathering in the palace of Caiaphas, the high priest, to map out their strategy. They wanted to arrest him furtively and have him killed, but did not think it prudent to do it during the feast, the people might react violently against his execution. It is incredible that Israel's religious leaders took the lead in plotting the death of their Messiah. They should have been the first to recognize and to enthrone him. Instead, they formed the vanguard of his enemies. Be a Jesus anointed at Bethany, 26,6,13. 26 6, 7 This incident provides a welcome relief, coming amid the treachery of the priests, the pettiness of the disciples, and the perfidy of Judas. When Jesus was at the house of Simon the leper in Bethany, a woman came in and poured out a flask of very expensive perfume on his head. The costliness of her sacrifice expressed the depth of her devotion for the Lord Jesus, saying, in effect, that there was nothing too good for him. 26 colon 8, 9 His disciples, and Judas in particular, John 12 verses 4 and 5, looked upon the act as an enormous waste. They thought the money might better have been given to the poor. 26 colon 10, 12 Jesus corrected their distorted thinking. Her act was not wasteful, but beautiful. Not only so, it was perfectly timed. The poor can be helped at any time. But only once in the world's history could the Savior be anointed for burial. That moment had struck and one lone woman with spiritual discernment had seized it. Believing the Lord's predictions concerning his death, she must have realized it was now or never. As it turned out, she was right. Those women who planned to anoint his body after his burial were thwarted by the resurrection, Mark 16 verses 1-6. 26 colon 13 The Lord Jesus immortalized her simple act of love, assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Any act of true worship fills the courts of heaven with fragrance and is indelibly recorded in the Lord's memory. See the treachery of Judas, 26 colon 14, 16. 26 colon 14, 15 Then one of the twelve, one of the disciples who had lived with the Lord Jesus, traveled with him, seen his miracles, heard his incomparable teaching, and witnessed the miracle of a sinless life, one whom Jesus could call my familiar friend, who ate my bread, Psalm 41 verse 9, it was that one who lifted up his heel against the Son of God. Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and agreed to sell his master for thirty pieces of silver. The priests paid him on the spot the contemptible total of about fifteen dollars. It is striking to note the contrast between the woman who anointed Jesus at Simon's home and Judas. She valued the Savior highly. Judas valued him lightly. 26 colon 16 And so the one who had received nothing but kindness from Jesus went out to arrange his part of the dreadful bargain. D of the last Passover, 26 colon 17, 25 26 colon 17 It was the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread a time when all leaven was removed from Jewish homes. What thoughts must have flooded the mind of the Lord as he sent the disciples into Jerusalem to prepare for the Passover? Every detail of the meal would have poignant significance. 26 colon 18 20 Jesus sent the disciples to look for a certain unnamed man who would lead them to the appointed house. 
perhaps the vagueness of the instructions was designed to foil the conspirators. At any rate, we note Jesus' full knowledge of individuals, their whereabouts, and their willingness to cooperate. Note his words, the teacher says, My time is at hand, I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. He faced his approaching death with poise. With perfect grace, he arranged the meal. What a privilege for this anonymous man to lend his house for this final Passover. 26 colon 21 to 24 As they were eating, Jesus made the shocking announcement that one of the twelve would betray him. The disciples were filled with sorrow, chagrin, and self-distrust. One by one they asked, Lord, is it I? When all but Judas had inquired, Jesus told them that it was the one who dipped with him in the dish. The Lord then took a piece of bread, dipped it in the meat juice, and handed it to Judas, John 13 verse 26, a token of special affection and friendship. He reminded them that there was a certain irresistibility in what was going to happen to him. But that did not free the traitor from responsibility, it would be better for him if he had never been born. Judas deliberately chose to sell the Savior and is thus held personally responsible. 26 25 When Judas finally asked point blank if he were the one, Jesus answered, Yes. E. The First Lord's Supper, 26 26 29 In John 13 verse 30 we learn that as soon as Judas received the piece of bread, he went out, and it was night. We therefore conclude that he was not present when the Lord's Supper was instituted, although there is considerable disagreement on this point. 26 After observing his last Passover, the Savior instituted what we know as the Lord's Supper. The essential elements, bread and wine, were already on the table as part of the Paschal meal, Jesus clothed them with new meaning. First he took bread, blessed and broke it. As he gave it to the disciples he said, Take, eat, this is my body. Since his body had not yet been given on the cross, it is clear that he was speaking figuratively, using the bread to symbolize his body. 26 colon 27, 28 The same is true of the cup, the container is used to express the thing contained. The cup contained the fruit of the vine, which in turn was a symbol of the blood of the new covenant. The new, unconditional covenant of grace would be ratified by his precious blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. His blood was sufficient to provide forgiveness for all. But here it was shed for many and that it was only effective in removing the sins of those who believe. 26 colon 29 The Savior then reminded his disciples that he would not drink from the fruit of the vine with them again until he returned to earth to reign. Then the wine would have a new significance, it would speak of the joy and blessedness of his Father's kingdom. The question is often raised whether we should use leavened or unleavened bread, fermented or unfermented wine for the Lord's Supper. There is little doubt that the Lord used unleavened bread and fermented wine, all wine in those days was fermented. Those who argue that leavened bread spoils the type, leaven is a picture of sin, should realize that the same is true of fermentation. It is a tragedy when we become so occupied with the elements that we fail to see the Lord himself. Paul emphasized that it is the spiritual meaning of the bread, not the bread itself, that counts. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, 1 Corinthians 5 verses 7 and 8. It is not the leaven in the bread that matters, but the leaven in our lives. F. The Self-Confident Disciples, 26 colon 30, 35. 26 colon 30 Following the Lord's Supper, the little band sang a hymn, probably taken from Psalms 113 to 118, The Great Hallow. Then they left Jerusalem, crossed the brook Kidron, and climbed the western slope of Olivet to the Garden of Gethsemane. 2631 Throughout his earthly ministry, the Lord Jesus had faithfully warned his disciples concerning the pathway ahead. Now he told them that they would all dissociate themselves from him that night. Fear would overwhelm them when they saw the fury of the storm breaking. To save their own skins, they would forsake their master. Zechariah's prophecy would be fulfilled, strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, 13 colon 7. 26 32 But he did not leave them without hope. Though they would be ashamed of their association with him, he would never forsake them. After rising from the dead, he would meet them in Galilee. Wonderful, never-failing friend.
26 33, 34 Peter rashly interrupted to assure the Lord that although the others might desert him, he would never do such a thing. Jesus corrected the never to this night three times. Before the rooster crowed, the impetuous disciple would deny his master three times. 26 35 Still protesting his loyalty, Peter insisted that he would die with Christ rather than deny him. All the disciples chimed in their agreement. They were sincere, they meant what they said. It was just that they didn't know their own hearts. G. The Agony in Gethsemane, 26, 36, 46 No one can approach this account of the Garden of Gethsemane without realizing that he is walking on holy ground. Anyone who attempts to comment on it feels a tremendous sense of awe and reticence. As Guy King wrote, the supernal character of the event causes one to fear lest one should in any way spoil it by touching it. 26 36 38 After entering Gethsemane, meaning olive vat or olive press, Jesus told eight of the eleven disciples with him to sit and wait, then took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee deeper into the garden. Might this suggest that different disciples have different capacities for empathizing with the Savior in his agony? He began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. He frankly told Peter, James, and John that his soul was exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. This was doubtless the unspeakable revulsion of his holy soul as he anticipated becoming a sin offering for us. We who are sinful cannot conceive what it meant to him, the sinless one, to be made sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. 26 39 It is not surprising that he left the three and went a little farther into the garden. No one else could share his suffering or pray his prayer, O oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Lest we think this prayer expressed reluctance or a desire to turn back, we should remember his words in John 12 verses 27 and 28, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Therefore, in praying that the cup might pass from him, he was not asking to be delivered from going to the cross. That was the very purpose of his coming into the world. The prayer was rhetorical, that is, it was not intended to elicit an answer but to teach us a lesson. Jesus was saying in effect, My Father, if there is any other way by which ungodly sinners can be saved than by my going to the cross, reveal that way now. But in all of this, I want it known that I desire nothing contrary to your will. What was the answer? There was none, the heavens were silent. By this eloquent silence we know that there was no other way for God to justify guilty sinners than for Christ, the sinless Savior, to die as our substitute. 26 40, 41 Returning to the disciples, he found them sleeping. Their spirits were willing, their flesh was weak. We dare not condemn them when we think of our own prayer lives, we sleep better than we pray, and our minds wander when they should be watching. How often the Lord has to say to us as he said to Peter, Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. 26.42 Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, expressing submission to the Father's will. He would drink the cup of suffering and death to the dregs. He was necessarily alone in his prayer life. He taught the disciples to pray, and he prayed in their presence, but he never prayed with them. The uniqueness of his person and work precluded others from sharing in his prayer life. 26.43-45 When he came to the disciples the second time, they were asleep again. Likewise the third time, he prayed, they slept. It was then he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. 26.46 The opportunity of watching with him and his vigil was gone. The footsteps of the traitor were already audible. Jesus said, Rise, let us be going not in retreat but to face the foe. Before we leave the garden, let us pause once more to hear his sobs, to ponder his sorrow, and to thank him with all our hearts. H. Jesus betrayed and arrested in Gethsemane, 26.47, 56. The betrayal of the sinless Savior by one of his own creatures presents one of the most amazing anomalies of history. Apart from human depravity we would be at a loss to explain the base, inexcusable treachery of Judas. 
26:47 While Jesus was still speaking to the eleven, Judas arrived with a gang armed with swords and clubs. Surely the weapons were not Judas's idea, he had never seen the Savior resist or fight back. Perhaps the weapons symbolized the determination of the chief priests and elders to capture him without any possibility of escape. 26:48 Judas would use a kiss as the sign to help the mob distinguish Jesus from his disciples. The universal symbol of love was to be prostituted to its lowest use. 26:49 As he approached the Lord, Judas said, "Greetings, Rabbi," then kissed him profusely. Two different words for kiss are used in this passage. The first, in verse 48, is the usual word for kiss. But in verse 49 a stronger word is used, expressing repeated or demonstrative kissing. 26-50 With poise and convicting penetration, Jesus asked, Friend, why have you come? No doubt the question came with scalding power to Judas, but events were moving fast now. The mob surged in and seized the Lord Jesus without delay. 26:51 One of the disciples, we know from John 18 verse 10, that it was Peter, drew his sword and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. It is unlikely that Peter had aimed for the ear, he had doubtless planned a mortal blow. That his aim was as poor as his judgment must be attributed to divine providence. 26:52 The moral glory of the Lord Jesus shines radiantly here. First he rebuked Peter, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. In Christ's kingdom, victories are not won by carnal means. To resort to armed force in spiritual warfare is to invite disaster. Let the enemies of the kingdom use the sword, they will eventually need defeat. Let the soldier of Christ resort to prayer, the word of God, and the power of a spirit-filled life. We learn from Dr. Luke that Jesus then healed the ear of Malchus, for that was the victim's name, Luke 22 verse 51, John 18 verse 10. Is this not a wonderful display of grace? He loved those who hated him and showed kindness to those who were after his life. 26 colon 53, 54 If Jesus had desired to resist the mob, he would not have been limited to Peter's puny sword. In an instant he could have asked for and been sent more than 12 legions of angels, from 36,000 to 72,000. But that would only have frustrated the divine program. The scriptures predicting his betrayal, suffering, crucifixion, and resurrection had to be fulfilled. 26.55 Then Jesus reminded the crowds how incongruous it was for them to come out after him with weapons. They had never seen him resort to violence or engage in plunder. Rather, he had been a quiet teacher, daily sitting in the temple. They could easily have captured him then, but didn't. Why come now with swords and clubs? Humanly speaking, their behavior was irrational. 26.56 Yet the Savior realized that man's wickedness was succeeding only in accomplishing the definite plan of God. All this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Realizing there would be no deliverance for their master, all the disciples forsook him and fled in panic. If their cowardice was inexcusable, ours is more so. They had not yet been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we have. 1. Jesus before Caiaphas, 26 colon 57, 68. 26 colon 57 There were two main trials of the Lord Jesus, a religious trial before the Jewish leaders, and a civil trial before the Roman authorities. Combining the accounts from all four Gospels shows that each trial had three stages. John's account of the Jewish trial shows that Jesus was first brought before Caiaphas' father-in-law, Annas. Matthew's account begins with the second stage at the home of Caiaphas, the high priest. The Sanhedrin were assembled there. Ordinarily, accused men were given an opportunity to prepare their defense. But the desperate religious leaders hurried Jesus away from prison and justice, Isaiah 53 verse 8, in every way denying him a fair trial. On this particular night, the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, and elders who comprised the Sanhedrin showed an utter disregard for the rules under which they were supposed to operate. They were not supposed to meet at night nor during any of the Jewish feasts. They were not supposed to bribe witnesses to commit perjury. A death verdict was not to be carried out until a night had elapsed. And, unless they met in the Hall of Hewn Stone, in the temple area, their verdicts were not binding. In their eagerness to get rid of Jesus, 
the Jewish establishment did not hesitate to stoop to breaking their own laws. 26 58 Caiaphas was the presiding judge. The Sanhedrin apparently served as both jury and prosecution, an irregular combination, to say the least. Jesus was the defendant. And Peter was a spectator, from a safe distance, he sat with the guards to see the end. 26 59 61 The Jewish leaders had a difficult time finding false testimony against Jesus. They would have been more successful had they fulfilled their prior obligation in the judicial process and sought evidence of his innocence. Finally, two false witnesses produced a garbled account of Jesus' words, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up, John 2 verses 19-21. According to the witnesses, he had threatened to destroy the temple in Jerusalem and then rebuild it. In fact, he had been predicting his own death and subsequent resurrection. The Jews now used that prediction as an excuse for killing him. 26 62 63 During these accusations, the Lord Jesus said nothing, as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Isaiah 53 verse 7. The high priest, irritated by his silence, pressed him for a statement, still the Savior refrained from answering. The high priest then said to him, I put you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. The law of Moses required that a Jew testify when put under oath by the high priest, Leviticus 5 verse 1. 26 64 Being an obedient Jew under the law, Jesus answered, It is as you said. He then asserted his messiahship and deity even more strongly, Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power, and coming on the clouds of heaven. In essence, he was saying, I am the Christ, the Son of God, as you have said. My glory is presently veiled in a human body, I appear to be just another man. You see me in the days of my humiliation. But the day is coming when you Jews will see me as the glorified one, equal in all respects with God, sitting at his right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. In verse 64 the first you is singular, referring to Caiaphas. The second you is plural, also the third, referring to the Jews as representative of those Israelites living at the time of Christ's glorious appearing, who will clearly see that he is the Son of God. The assertion is sometimes made, writes Lenski, that Jesus never called himself the Son of God. Here, in verse 64, he swears that he is no less. 26 65, 67 Caiaphas did not miss the point. Jesus had alluded to a messianic prophecy of Daniel, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. The high priest's reaction proves that he understood Jesus was claiming equality with God, see John 5 verse 18. He tore his priestly clothes, a sign that the witness had blasphemed. His inflammatory words to the Sanhedrin assumed Jesus was guilty. When asked their verdict, the council answered, he is deserving of death. 26 68 The second stage of the trial ended with the jurist striking and spitting upon the accused, then taunting him to use his power as Christ to identify his assailants. The entire proceeding was not only unjuridical, but scandalous. J. Peter denies Jesus and weeps bitterly, 26 69 75. 26 69 72 Peter's darkest hour had now arrived. As he sat outside in the courtyard, a young woman came by and accused him of being an associate of Jesus. His denial was vigorous and prompt, I do not know what you are saying. He went out to the gateway, perhaps to escape further notice. But there another girl publicly identified him as one who had been with Jesus of Nazareth. This time he swore that he did not know the man the man was his master. 26 73, 74 A little later several bystanders came saying, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. A simple denial was no longer sufficient, this time he confirmed it with oaths and curses. I do not know the man. With disquieting timing, a rooster crowed. 26 75 The familiar sound pierced not only the quiet of the early hours, but Peter's heart as well. The deflated disciple, remembering what the Lord had said, went out and wept bitterly. There is a seeming contradiction in the Gospels concerning the number and timing of the denials. 
In Matthew, Luke, and John, Jesus is reported as saying, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times, Matthew 26 verse 34, see also Luke 22 verse 34, John 13 verse 38. In Mark, the prediction is, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times, Mark 14 verse 30. Possibly there was more than one rooster crowing, one during the night and another at dawn. Also it is possible that the Gospels record at least six different denials by Peter. He denied Christ before, 1, a young woman, Matthew 26 verses 69 and 70, Mark 14 verses 66 to 68, 2, another young woman, Matthew 26 verses 71 and 72, Mark 14 verses 69 and 70, 3, the crowd that stood by, Matthew 26 verses 73 and 74, Mark 14 verses 70 and 71, 4, a man, Luke 22 verse 58, 5, another man, Luke 22 verses 59 and 60, 6, a servant of the high priest, John 18 verses 26 and 27. We believe this last man is different from the others because he said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? The others are not described as saying this. Well, this ends another one of our podcasts. And until next time, just remember, God is out here. And you can find out all about him in your Bibles. All you have to do is pick it up and read it i have mine right here and uh god is in this bible so please read it with that said bye for now till next time